All right, guys. Well, first, uh, I just want to say, you know, how amazing I think it is. And, and I'll talk about it a little bit in my presentation, just, you know, one, what you're doing for the coaching community and two, you know, how we're making such um, strides in such a um, negative situation. Um, but, you know, if you're not getting better as a coach in this day and age, um, you know, you're just not trying because the amount of resources out there is remarkable. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if I have all the answers. I don't think I'm a qualified guru by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I will share with you what kind of what I've learned. Um, and, you know, uh, hopefully if you guys have any questions, feel free to jump in. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, one, one of the topics that has kind of been going around in coaching off circles or coaching circles this off season has kind of been, you know, how do I um, bridge the gap? Um, you know, I've been a position coach for X amount of years. Um, I'm interested in being a coordinator. What do I need to do um, to, to take that next step? And so um, we're going to cover that today. Um, and then I'm going to give you guys some materials if you guys are interested at the end. You know, um, I've got some watermarks on them, but um, if you want them, just ask. Um, so a little bit about me real quick. Um, I'm going into my 10th year of coaching high school football in North Carolina, all in North Carolina. Um, you know, I've coached at the high school with the only number one overall NFL draft pick, Mario Williams, Rich Lands, and I've also coached at the high school with the most NFL draft picks, obviously Independence. Um, Havlock might get in there and argue a little bit. I think there's a tie or something like that. But, um, you know, I'm on my third offensive coordinator job, but if you know anything about what I mean, that means I've been fired twice. Um, so, you know, I do not claim to be a guru by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but um, that's just a little bit about me. Um, and, you know, there's my Twitter handle real quick. I'll put it up there again for you guys at the end. Um, you know, if you need to get in contact with me about this presentation, phone number, whatever, reach out anytime. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about this profession is I think that it's one of the greatest ones in the world. One, just because we get to do what we love and we get to bring the passion and energy and juice every day um, and impact young men's lives. Um, but two, you know, just because like Richard or Coach Bailey was saying yesterday, you know, that there's no such thing as, you know, original in football. It's all carbon copy. You know, it, I borrowed from him. I borrowed from him. I mean, you just try to put together the best um, thing that fits you. And, and, you know, one of the things that we'll talk about in, the, in this um, PowerPoint is just how fit is a very important thing. Um, you know, what you do at Jack Britt High School, you might not be able to get away with at Independence and, and vice versa. And that, that's not a knock on either program. It's just, you know, th there's different external factors that impact both jobs. Um, so as a coach, knowing your environment, knowing the type of kids you're coaching, um, knowing the things that's expected of you from your administration um, are all things that are going to help you succeed. Um, kind of just downplaying on, on what I just talked about, you know, I mean, I set a school record for points per game. And when I say I, um, I mean we, you know, none of this would have been possible without the coaches that I was working for and working with and the players. But, I mean, you know, when you're a young coordinator and you're, and you're coming in, um, you know, it's kind of like being a young coach. It, it's just my guys, how many points can I put up and things like that. Um, and, and obviously that doesn't mean anything because I clearly got fired after that season. So, um, you know, the whole thing with football is right. You're, you're getting, they, they fire, they hire you to fire you, right? So <clears throat> um, I just want to talk about, you know, starting out with um, just the difference in a mindset between a position coach and a coordinator. Um, you know, a position coach, 90% of the time, most of the time, it's my guys. And, you know, th th that's great within the position. You know, you're building that camaraderie. I know um, I've worked with coaches, especially the receiver coaches that have gotten their guys, um, like, compression shirts that all matched or, or things like that. And you're creating that family identity and that family unit, and that's great. Um, but a a as, you know, you shift to a coordinator role, it's everything times three or times four, depending on how many spots are on your side of the ball, you know. When, 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 you're, when you're doing position groups, you're doing indie plans and installs and drills and position manuals for one group of kids. When you're doing that, um, from a coordinator standpoint, you're doing it for three groups of kids, um, or at least for me anyways, you know, quarterbacks, running backs, receivers, um, O-line, and then, it, you know, if, if we mix in some tight ends. Um, so it kind of changes the, 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 the broad spectrum. I think, you know, one of the things that, that gets lost in, in the coordination aspect of things is, you know, you're not necessarily there to reinvent the wheel or be smart, especially if you're going into a system. You know, there's system programs and there's non-system programs, and we'll talk about the difference in those um, a little bit later. But, um, you know, going into those, you know, you, you kind of have to adjust. And, um, you know, as you get, like I was just talking about, when you're a first, when you're, and when you make that transition, e even though you're supposed to be in 
our guy or a we guy, um, you still have tendencies to revert back. And that's just a youth thing. I think um, Coach Colthorpe the other day talked about those young guys just doing stuff, reinventing the wheel. Well, why are you doing it? Um, and I think, you know, a as you progress on this and everybody's different and every situation is different, there's no exact blueprint how to get a coordinating job. So if you think I'm sitting here going to give you some secret formula, um, that's probably not going to happen. Um, but as you, as you progress on that mindset, you know, at, at five years ago, you know, I was like, oh, how can I have the flashiest office gimmicky? And, and we'll talk about that, the whole millennial effect and how the millennials, um, j just this false perception on the profession. Um, but now I'm thinking, you know, how can we win games? You know, if I need to take 20 less snaps a game, if, 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 you know, we don't need to throw the ball, if we need to run the ball more, what do we need to do to give our kids the best chance to win? Um, and, and that was, you know, one, one of the boneheaded things I had to learn the hard way being a young head coach or uh, being a young coordinator and um, bouncing around. So um, the first thing you need to ask yourself, you know, are, are you growing within the profession? And, and, you know, one of the things, that, that I was kind of talking about earlier, you know, if you're not getting better as a coach in the year 2020 um, in any sport, there is a major effort issue. Um, the amount of resources that are out there, uh, there's more than they've ever been. They're cheaper than they've ever been. You know, 20 years ago, you'd have to go to a coach's clinic, drop $20 on a book, um, you know, and then you might get something out of it. You might not. Yes, sir, coach. Uh, we got a question here. Yes, sir. Um, as a young coordinator, how do or did you deal with older coaches that may give you some pushback to what you're trying to do because of your age? Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But um, I think, you know, I, I think the, the one thing that is the, the universal language is knowledge. So if you can prove that you know what you're talking about um, if, and you can prove why, I think you'll gain some respect in those circles. You know, I, I spent – two or three years coaching semi-pro football um, in Eastern NC. And, you know, going out there with 25, 26-year-olds, 27, 28-year-olds, when I'm 21 years old and trying to convince those guys that I know more about football than them, which I may or may not have, but as a coach, you, you have to give the bravado that, that what you say is, is fact. And so how do you earn respect with your peers that are older than you? Um, and the biggest thing that I, I mean – just being able to prove that you know what you're talking about, not going out there and embarrassing yourself. If you don't know, you know, hey, I'll find the answer. Um, wait till next practice, whatever. But I, I think, you know, just being real in tune with, you know, how far along you are in your journey. Um, but I think, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a coaching thing. I think, you know, anybody in any professional field coming out these days, you know, especially coming out with the, the technology um, and the things that are taught in school, anytime you're going into the workforce and there's people that have been there 30, 40 years, um, 20 plus years, you know, there's going to be some blowback and there's going to be some resentment. Um, so, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is um, not getting caught up with it and, and just focus on the job that you're there to do. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later. I've been blessed to work with some really good defensive coordinators and, um, you know, tough, mean, nose sons of guns. And they made sure to keep me humble every time that, uh, you know, I opened my mouth as a young coach. So um, you need people to keep you sharp. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think, being able to explain yourself and showing competency is, is one of the biggest things that you can do. So I'm um, going back, you know, 2020, if you're not getting better, obviously there, there, there's, there, there's definitely um, a work ethic issue going on. Um, I mean, the things that are available to us, I mean, I just think, you know, even back when I was in high school, um, 15, 10 years ago, you know, just driving to exchange tapes, all the, all the stuff that, you know, we take for granted now, I mean, um, you know, if you want to learn something about the wing tee, you just Google wing tee. I mean, it is ridiculous. So, um, you know, if, if you're serious about being a coordinator and that's something that interests you and, and, you know, it's not for everybody. And the same thing with coordinators progressing to be head coaches, um, take advantage of it. I mean, th that's one of the biggest things is, you know, we tell our kids in the classroom. Um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. All right. So understand the fundamental differences between a position coach and a coordinator. As a position coach, you know, your ultimate goal is you want to display mastery of knowledge of your position. Um, manuals, you know, and that's more the college level. Next level, uh, I've seen people do it at the high school level. Um, but just being really in tune with your position and knowing how, how it affects the offense. Um, again, especially if you're going in to an offense, and we'll talk about the different ways that you can get coordinator titles. Um, but if you're going into an offensive scheme that already exists, um, you know, you better understand your position before you understand the other three positions are, I mean, how are you going to tell somebody else what to do or know if the, what they're doing is right if you're not squared away on your end first? Um, so that, that's one of the biggest things, you know, 
Um, and when you notice we go through this whole presentation, it's not about play calls. I'm not going to, I don't even think I have play call listed in here once. Um, there's just so much meat and potatoes that you have to do to, to even get to that point. Um, but, you know, being able, I mean, that's a huge difference, knowing what one guy does versus knowing what four guys do. do. Five guys, you know, depending on playing with tight end and defensive side, I know you got safeties, corners. Um, sometimes you got separate coaches. And being able to manage all those personalities, like um, the question was earlier, you know, how, how, how do you, um, you're getting blowback from older coaches, you know, that, that maybe feel that, that you were passed over or, or they were passed over and, and you got a shot and they didn't, um, you know, just love them up. Just love them up. Um, and, and then competency is everything. So growth mindset versus fixed mindset. That's one of the big things, you know, I want to get better versus nah, I'm good where I am. Um, and, you know, a lot of people want to get better, but, you know, in order to go up, you got to, to get to go up, you got to give up. And, that, and whether that's sacrificing time with your friends, um, freedom to go out on dates on the weekend, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the growth mindset, we're continuously learning because the game evolves, right? I mean, the things that are popular now weren't popular three years ago. You know, the RPO's taken off, um, and the, the game's constantly changing. And I guarantee, you know, whatever you did last season, the defenses you went against, those defensive coordinators are scheming ways to shut you down and, and take away things that you were good at. And then, you know, and the same thing with the offenses, if you were able to stymie them on some defenses. So the game is, 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 is fluid. It's always moving. Um, you know, and if you don't do anything to get better, you know, you just kind of get lost in the, in the, in the past. So – this is kind of what I, what I came up with when I was thinking about, you know, what is a good coordinator? What, what, what does a coordinator bring to the table? Um, and, I, and I think the biggest thing is trust, man. Um, you know, if you're getting named a coordinator, you're getting named a coordinator because the head coach trusts you with their job on the line. Um, and, and, and that's pretty much it. And, you know, there's several ways you can go about earning trust. Um, and, and we'll talk about that. But at the end of the day, it, it's all about trust. And, you know, the more years you work together and with your head coach and um, the more years you work as a staff, you know, you kind of understand where everybody stands. Um, but, but that, but that's the biggest thing, you know, if somebody was to ask me, how do you get a coordinator job? I would say trust. Um, and, and if I could sum it up in one word is that de is definitely trust, but it's a performance driven job. Obviously you got to be tough. We'll talk about the one um, as urban Meyer relates to it. Um, being able to compete in a room full of coaches. You know, we sit here and we talk to our players every day about being dogs. I need you to be a dog in the weight room. I need you to be a dog on the field. But, you know, are we being dogs as coaches when we're getting in that meeting room as far as game planning, breaking down film, um, attacking the spreadsheet for grades? You know, I mean, it, it's a daily grind and a daily competition. And, you know, the more coaches you can get on staff that had that mentality, I mean, the potential is endless. You get four or five guys like that, just trying to drag people's name through the mud just because I'm going to prove that I'm a better coach than you. Um, you know, healthy competition, uh, you know, it, it drives everything through the roof. Um, it, it's just like, you know, if you've got a two and a three that, that's pushing your starting quarterback, you know, everybody's going to be better. I mean, competition, you know, I mean, breeds champions in my opinion. So, um, but one of the biggest things is trust. And we'll talk about how you can develop that. Um, are you the one? So, so this is derived from Urban Meyer. Obviously, um, it's a little poem that says, out of every hundred men, um, 10 shouldn't even be there, 80 are just targets and none of the real fighters, but we are lucky to have them for they make the battle. Ah, but one, one is a warrior and he will bring the others back. Um, and so what that means to, to me as a coach is, you know, and it's not even about titles or, or flow chart or anything like that. It's how do you impact your team? How do you, how do you impact your staff of coaches that you're on? Um, are, are you the guy that's always coming in, bringing your problems to the group? Um, you know, bad body language, or are you always the guy walking in the office pepped up with a smile on your face? Like, hey, coach, how, what, what are we going to do today? Frank? But like, you know, how, how are we going to make it exciting today? I mean, how, how, how do you impact those around you? Um, because, you know, like we tell our players, you know, look at the um, Ray Lewis's of the world, the LeBron James, the great ones make everyone around them better. And you, and you don't have to have a title or a coordinator or head coach or any of that to, to achieve any of that. It, you know, if you come in in the mood somber, and there's a time and a place for everything. I'm not saying come in after the game, after you just got your eyes beat shut and be rah-rah and, and, you know, trying to be jovial. But, you know, are, are you the one that can rally the troops when, when all hope feels lost, when that game is down to one minute on the sidelines? Are, you know, can you keep your composure? Are you, are you going to be able to keep the kids co under control? Um, you know, and, and that, that's just one of the big things. You know, a, a year or two ago, um, 
we ultimately um, got disqualified from the playoffs because we had three or more kids step off our sideline, not get in the fight, but just step off our sideline. And um, one of the things that, that, that you can see in the video is, you know, we had a few coaches sitting there trying to hold everybody back. Um, and, and, you know, some other coaches that, that, that were just, you know, not aware that that situation was going down. But, you know, are, are you one that, that your, your colleagues are looking to in times of turmoil or when things are getting bad? Um, you know, and, and that's just, you know, how you impact the group. And, and every personality of every coaching staff is different. The makeup's different. So, you know, where you fit in on one team, you might not fit in on the other team. But, you know, the, the good ones find a way to, to make themselves versatile. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. So going back to the question that was asked earlier, the hardest worker. When you are the hardest worker, it compels those around you, coaches, colleagues, and admin to believe in you. They see the effort you put in in the trenches. Um, and, and so I, I, I firmly believe that, you know, um, you know, they, they, they want – when they see that you're invested, that they trust you. I mean, hypothetical situation, you're not going to give the game or the ball to the kid or that's missed all summer workouts – um, you know, it's just not going to do that. Or, or the kid that didn't en enroll in weightlifting and, and took the whole spring off, you're not going to feel comfortable with your job on the line giving the ball to that kid because you know he had not put in the time or the effort. And it's the same thing as a coach. You know, you're always wanting to be the hardest worker. Now, listen, don't, don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying, all right? There's a difference between being efficient and just being a grinder, all right? There, there's people that are grind, 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 and they're miserable and they're not efficient in what they're doing. You know, if you're taking eight or nine hours to do work that you can do four hours in, um, you know, there's an issue there. I mean, it's 2020. We, we've got all this great technology. You know, the, the coaching load's supposed to be getting easier because we've got all these uh, coaching services and, um, you know, huddle and, and things like that that, that make this – that do this stuff for us. You know, we don't have to break it down by hand. Um, so, you know, the whole grinding to a fault, you know, that that's a little overrated. But, you know, when you work hard, people trust you. They believe in you. Um, you know, and, and just like we tell our kids, like right now with this pandemic going on, or the epidemic that's going down, or the pandemic, I'm sorry, um, you know, we're telling our kids in the classroom, like the teachers want to see effort. As a coach, if you walk out past the practice field and you see your running back getting extra ladder drills or your lineman going through shoot, you're like, man, I have a lot of faith in that kid. Well, it's the same thing with our teachers in the classroom. You know, you better be reaching out, sending emails on your end because, you know, if the eligibility comes down after this Friday and grades go final, I mean, that's on you. So the same thing from colleagues and coworkers and admin, they just want to see that you're as invested as they are. Um, and, and that's one of the big things. And, you know, you can talk and be a salesman and give great pitches and all this great lip service, but they want to see action. You know, action, action's where truth lies. So um, you can't fake hard work. You know, I know Chad Greer kills it all the time. Hard work works. That, that's his jam. Um, but, I mean, it, it really does. Um, and, I mean, when you start, stop asking about titles and start looking around for work, you'll be surprised about how much you'll grow um, on your coaching journey. So tough, okay? Um, <clears throat> tough, tough is the opposite of sensitive, not soft. Um, and, and so, you know, I've, I've kind of got three, three mistakes that I made as a coach coming through the ranks. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk about myself a lot, but um, one of the first ones was um, we were playing a game um, you know, and this was one of those hard nosed DCs and it's funny, all three of these stories happened in the same year. Um, but, um, being that young coach that I was, and, you know, I was not a coordinator on the staff. So, um, you know, I was just fighting to earn my place. You know, I wanted to prove to them that I knew what I was talking about. I'm some young whippersnapper and I don't even know what I don't know. I'm just running my mouth and trying to bring energy and rah, rah and get people going. And, um, <clears throat> we, uh, we sat there and we we had, we were running wall return on kickoff and we do this thing where we run reverse and um, you know at, at three different points during the week I had a different coach from the staff come to me and they were asking well if you're not going to give him the the ball in the fake why why does he fake it in front the the, the kickoff team knows that you're not going to give it to him in front and so I had three different coaches come with me and have this conversation. Well, obviously, I knew that they had had this conversation together behind closed doors because it happened at three separate times. So, um, you know, being young and kind of insulted, like, y'all question me? Like, like, I mean, we, we just scored four touchdowns on it last year. Well, like, like we, we talked about this when you hired me. And um, so the opening kickoff of the game, we faked it in front, took it to the house. Um, as I ran down the sideline, I went up to that D.C. and I basically, you know, made a smart comment about how'd you like that fake? And um, next thing I know, I was getting jacked up on the sideline. 
um, <clears throat> basically put in my place, held under the armpit like a little child. Um, so that was one of those scenarios, you know, that kept me humble real quick. Like, okay, you might have been right, but, um, you know, one, you weren't tough enough, tough in the fact that you couldn't accept criticism. And two, um, shortly after that week, you know, it was just me being hardheaded and, and we switched it so it looked, you know, um, concise all the way around. Um, the, the second one was that same year, um, you know, when, when I went to the school, we had conversations, me and the head coach of, you know, install, installing the triple option of the offense. Um, we got in, lost our first four games. Um, coach comes in and tells me we're changing the offense. Um, we're going under center wing T. I'm about ready to cry, claw my freaking eyes out. Um, like, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't want to be a part of this. What, wing T? No, that's not for me. Um, and so, basically, as a coach, I didn't respond well. I, my whole philosophy was, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be here for the kids. I'm going to show up. I'm going to go to practice. Um, I'm going to work hard. Um, and, and I'm going to do my job. Um, but, you know, as the coach, your ultimate goal is you got to defend the program and you got to defend your kids. So for me, acting immature, just being a young coach, um, you know, not being able to handle that situation correctly, um, you know, was tough. And it ended up being a good pos position for me to be in because if you think about it, I, I was coaching the running back. So when we were in the sling tee, you know, I only had two players on the field. But when we transitioned to the wing tee under center, um, I ultimately had three players on the field, which gave me another person to coach. Um, so it ultimately ended up working out. Yes, sir, Coach. Coach, so question for you. <clears throat> uh, have you ever been a co-coordinator, and how would you handle that idea, philosophy, and game plan? Wow. I have not um, – I have been a – let me see how, let me see how I phrase this. Um, I have worked together with somebody to call plays. Um, I called him on the JV level, but on the varsity level, um, we kind of worked together and, and you know – one, we were really good friends, so it, so it made it work. Um, but two, I, I think you definitely have to know what each brings to the table, and I think you have to spend a lot of time around each other. And the reason I say that is because, you know, I saw Bill Belichick doing a thing where he was talking with his coordinators and his quarterbacks and just throwing out scenarios. And the more time you spend around each other, the more that you're going to know what each other likes in certain situations, whether it's first and, you know, 10 or third and long. Um, the more time you spend around each other and spend in those scenarios, you're going to know um, what each coach likes to call, what the quarterback likes, what the head coach likes. Um, but, I mean, that, that's the reason it's very important to get in those um, scenarios. But um, I think, you know, as a co-coordinator, I, I think just relying on each other's strengths. You know, everybody's got strengths. Everybody's got weaknesses. I think, you know, one of the biggest things that, that coordinating takes is being able to be organized, being able to um, delegate. And, and I, I think the whole thing with coordinating for me is just, like trying to expedite processes. And what I mean by that is, is you know, everybody's running inside, um, inside run. Everybody's running board drill. You know, everybody's throwing on air. How, what processes are you putting in place to expedite that process to give you two times as many reps, three times as many reps? How, how are you, you know, basically taking Henry Ford and the Model T, how, how are you taking that to take something that's already good and be able to make it better? Um, and, and before you can make anything better, and we're going to talk about this, is you have to understand it thoroughly. You have to show mastery. Um, so, um, but yeah, uh, so th that's basically, you know, um, a, a way where not necessarily I wasn't acting tough as a physical person. Th that was a scenario where I wasn't acting tough as an emotional person. Um, you know, and, and being an assistant coach, guess what? You're in the chain of command. I mean, it's, you're going to have no sometimes. Um, my first year at Richlands, I remember, and this kind of just lets you know where my head was at, I read this book called The 46 Defense. And I was like, all gung-ho on the 46, you know. And, um, you know, somebody called it the 4-6. I was like, you're wrong. It's the 46. And, then, you know, I did this whole presentation. I said it for like two nights straight, um, you know, college Ritalin. Um, just getting after it, putting together presentations. And so I go into my head coach and I'm like, coach, look at this defense. It's the greatest thing ever invented. It's the 46. I went in and I, I like, you know, every, every player on our roster to either Richard Den or um, Ron Rivera, you know, I, I had a, who our equal was and we watched this um, slide. And then he looked at me and he's like, first off, I just want to say, you know, it's really impressive that you did this. Uh, you know, you did a good job. Second, um, we don't have anybody like the 85 Bears on our defense, so no, we're not running it. Um, all right, we're going to move on. And so I was like, okay, touche. So, you know, being tough is just, you know, not getting in your feelings, not holding a grudge. It's all about getting better at the end of the day. 
you know, I sometimes I know sometimes we get in our feelings when we don't hear what we want to hear. Um, but you know, just know it, it's ultimately for for the good of growth. And, and side note, you know, that whole wing tee story turned out great because I got to go do inside run every day with one of the best wing tee coaches in Eastern NC. Um, and it provided more. I learned more about the run game in that one year from him. Um, and we ended up going the third round of the playoffs. So it, everything works out, even if you can't see it. Just just don't pound, keep trucking. Um, competitive greatness. You know, John Wooden talks about this in his triangle, you know, uh, what competitive greatness is. And competitive greatness simply is defined as um, doing your best when your best is required. Um, and, you know, as a coordinator, that might be calling plays. As, you know, as a position coach, it might not be. It might be getting the right guy in the game in an effective substitution. It might be um, making the correct change on the sideline during a timeout via iPad. Or, I mean, there, there's a myriad of things that fall within your jurisdiction that, that, that talk about competitive greatness. When the game's online, are you, are you acting crazy? Or are you all shook up? Do, do you, like, you know, are you not have that calm vibe to you? Or are you giving that, that you know, wholesome presentation that, you know, everything's going to be okay? Like, you know, not too high, not too low. You, you want to stay right there, even kill the road. You don't want to be the one running around with, like, the chicken with their head cut off. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and it might not be in a game. You know, we might be sitting there, get ready to go out. You know, somebody might have forgot the ball bag. You know, who's the coach closest? You know, who, who, who can get the job done? Who can get done what we need right now? Again, it's not all about play calling. It's about doing what's best for the team and um, giving your, ch your, guy, your guys the best chance they have to succeed. Um, so, you know, being able to give your best when your best is required. And the only way that you can do that is obviously being able to, to, to be in those situations, be in the fire, um, be able to rep it. Um, and, and I'll talk about some things that some staffs do to, to kind of get their coaches ready that I think is really cool, by the way. Um, all right, all in. You must give up to go, in order to go up. You know, to get closer to your dream, you got to give up things. you got to sacrifice in, in the eventual effort that everything's going to be fine in the end or you're going to get what you want or attain what you want out of it. Um, so, you know, you, you can't be sitting here mad at the kids. You wouldn't let your kid, you know, go to the beach or, or, or go hang out with his girlfriend and miss summer workouts or anything like that. So as a coordinator position coach, you know, it's, it's probably not acceptable. I mean, now I know there's some underlying circumstances and, you know, every staff's different in, in the level of commitment. Um, and also I think it's important to realize as a coordinator and, and head coach, or just anyone managing people that, you know, not everybody wants to be a head coach and that's fine. Um, you know, you, you have some volunteers or coaches that, that can't give the same level of effort, and that's not a down on them. Um, you know, you're thankful that you can utilize them to the cause. Um, but, you know, everybody's not the same, and that's fine. Now, ideally, if you're building a staff, you know, you want as many future head coaches on that staff as possible because, you know, those are the guys that are long-term committed to the profession and, you know, um, their jobs are kind of tied to it for the most part. Um, but, but, but it's a grind, you know. But you, you need your volunteer guys, too, and, and you know, and, and that's not good, bad, or indifferent. You know, I know that the, in the private sector, you know, there's some volunteer guys that have head coaching jobs. Um, and, and, you know, um, it, it is what it is. But, you know, if, if you're really about this life, you know, you, you got to give up to go up. So, I mean, and, and there's not really much about that. Um, it's just the expectations that come with the job. Um, so, you know, one, one of the big things is how, how do I make the jump? How, how do I make the jump? So, so, so what, how, how, do I, how do I get there? I, I check all those boxes. How do I make the jump? All right, well, we talked about it earlier, trust, all right? So, so there's two ways, and this kind of holds true as far as um, head coaching jobs as well. Um, so you can either basically earn trust being relationship-driven, or you can earn trust being results-driven. All right. So results driven would be like your track record, you know, doing a track record. Sorry, doing a great job coordinating for a team, um, you know, interview. Well, you enter a team has a um, OC or DC or special teams coordinator opening and you go and you you, you interview well and your vision lines up with what the head coach wants. Um, on the flip side of that relationship driven, you know, loyalty to the head coach, you've shown you're proving that you're capable being a key word there being promoted from within it. You know, if you look at a lot of the good programs, I know I'm giving head coach examples right now in North Carolina, but, you know, a lot of the good programs promote from within. I mean, if you look at Shelby, Shelby did a great job. They didn't miss a beat when they lost Lance Ware. Um, Weddington with Andy Capone, um, you know, but, but the same thing, 
system programs, you know, they usually don't miss a beat because uh, they know what the expectations are and, and it's just passed down from within. Another way though, that you can build trust is building trust with your assistant coaches, you know, coordinators on your staff that are current coordinators that might be getting ready to take another job. Um, assistant coaches that might be getting ready to take another job. You know, so the AFCA this summer, and I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but you know, you're going to get hired by your peers. You know, when, 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 when they're, they're going to be the reason you get hired, whether it's your peers working together with you to win games, set records, get kids in college, or different track, you know, the people that you went to school with are now transitioning into administrator jobs. You know, if, if you're a head coach in the building, you better know every person that's an um, admin intern in your administration because you never know when the English teacher up the hall is getting ready to get a principal job and you might miss your shot um, <clears throat> just because you're always interviewing. Every day is an interview, um, you know, and, and that never goes down. Dress the part, you know, be able to sit there and, and – um, carry yourself like a professional in the building, outside the building, at games at all times, <clears throat> because you never know when you're going to get your shot. Um, but th those are pretty much the two. And, and you know, uh, there could be an outside way, but th those are pretty much two. You either get promoted from within, you leave with a member of your staff, or you sit there and um, it's results driven. You do really – you have a great, really great season. So. Coach, question for you quick. Yes, sir. Uh, what was the biggest hurdle or adjustment that you had uh, to overcome when transitioning from position coach to a coordinator? I, I think the hardest thing for me was um, seeing the, the all 22 picture, how, how all, all 22 parts fit together. Um, and, you know, and, and it's almost like you don't see 22 people at once, especially in practice. You just kind of, learn the blocking schemes, and you know if that backside defensive end makes the tackle, you know who missed their blocker, who's supposed to be accounting for him pre-snap. Um, and obviously things can change, but um, I think being able to see that 22 picture is huge because I think, um, you know, some people can see it, some people can't, some people get tunnel vision, um, but it takes a long time. You know, you, you, I started out up in the box, you know, and I was looking, I wanted to watch the ball every play. Well, you can't give your coach or your coordinators anybody good feedback watching the ball every play, but it's human nature. You, you have to physically train yourself not to watch the ball. Um, and, you know, my first coordinator job, I mean, listen, all this stuff comes in different that there's levels to this thing. All right. My first coordinator job, I was like 22 um, and I called zero plays and I, I had no clue what I didn't even know. Like, was I ready to be a coordinator? And I, absolutely not. Um, and obviously after that year, I, I, I was fired. But um, being able to, you know, jump in the fire and and. and Basically, what I was doing was I was I was basically being a GA. I mean, I'll show you some of the um, resources that I've got to kind of help you guys with that. But you know, I was drawing up diagrams, I was drawing up plays, I was drawing up the playbook, I was you know charting kickoffs. I'm um, all with the help of my head coach. It's almost like an apprenticeship, almost. Um, and he was just teaching me everything that he knew. It was very meticulous because one of my weaknesses is I'm not a very organized person. Like if, if you could see my handwriting, like my handwriting is not good. Um, and, and the guy that I was working for is extremely organized. So we just kind of counterbalanced ourselves that way. And, um, you know, but it did get frustrating at times because, you know, yeah, cool. I had this coordinator title, but what are you coordinating? You're not coordinating anything. You're, you're just, you know, um, you're grinding is what you're doing. Um, but it set me up to, to kind of launch later in life. And so, you know, being around this game and talking to some of the um, old school coaches, I put the top four in uh, – Underline because they may or may not apply. You know, you get schools that, you know, have turf fields. You don't have to pull strings. You know, you don't have to paint the field. You don't have to mow the field because you got turf. Um, you know, if you got people that wash your team laundry, you don't have to do that either. Um, but this is the type of physical experience that you can get um, that, that's invaluable. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, that comes up with the millennial generation and things like that is people just want to get to the top quick. I mean, I think we've seen the end of coaches putting 25, 30 years into uh, – to, to a one location, um, if, they, if they do, it's a very special place, which means they want to be there. But I don't think, you know, I think that the loyalty thing has kind of changed within the past 10 to 15 years. And so, you know, being able to um, get these physical experiences, um, you know, I know a lot talking to older coaches, one of the things is with the younger coaches, they feel they're too good to do things. Uh, for example, uh, you know, clean up, like if you're breaking down an end zone camera, for example, or um, 
you know, washing pads or dipping pads or just little menial tasks that are essential to um, being able to run a program that, you know, people think that, that's beneath them. Um, and, you know, if you're trying to network your way through this thing, like you cannot have that mentality at all because every day is an opportunity. Um, you know, and, and as you see, you know, you're also getting experience that's putting you closer to head coaching experience as well. Um, you know, being able to manage large groups of people. I think that was kind of the question earlier about, you know, how, how do you manage coaches um, that are older than you, you know, that, that might feel slighted or, or, or whatever. How do, you, how do you earn their respect? Um, and, and, you know, it's definitely challenging because, you know, not everybody's just going to be all, you know, warm and fuzzies. So you, you got to be able to recruit people on your team and, you know, win people over and try to get them on the bus, as John Gordon says. Um, being able to tag a film session, knowing what you're looking at. You know, I know a lot of the knock on the millennial coaches coming out these days are, oh, they're tech guys. They're not real coaches. You know, they're, they're this, that, and the other. Well, um, those tech guys are getting ready to be dominating because with the, the current situation that we're in, the programs that are going to be able to find a way to survive and advance or adjust on the fly are going to be light years ahead of the other programs that can't. And what I mean by that is, you know, are you utilizing Zoom? Are you utilizing Huddle? Um, are you finding ways to get in touch with your kids? Are you checking eligibility? Um, you know, if, if you're stuck in the 19th century, um, you're going to have a lot of – a real hard time connecting with your kids. Um, you know, and I, I just think that the, the teams and programs that they can adjust to that are going to be doing a lot better than the ones that can't because we're all on this kind of level playing field as is. Um, but tagging film, film kind of gives you that GA, you know, work that, that you need to, you know, because we're going to talk about self-scouting here in a minute. And, you know, you, can, you need to be able to input a stat or a spreadsheet and be able to work with a spreadsheet and work with Huddle to be able – or know somebody that does. That's always an answer. You know, you can find somebody that's sufficient in one of your weaknesses. Um, lead a film session. And so – and this isn't like me telling you that this is what you need to do, but this is what you guys need experience in. Um, so, for example, I think uh, Coach Metzger down at Pinecrest, he does a really great job with this. And the offseason, um, basically, he, he does – coach-led film sessions in, in, you know, garages at the school at various places. And what he does is each coach, you know, they give a presentation on their topic, whether it's their position or if he gives them a specific topic and they present to the group. So now, you know, as an assistant coach, you're getting comfortable speaking in front of people. You're getting comfortable, you know, knowing your material because in order to teach, teaching is the, the second level. You know, first you have to learn and then you have to be able to teach. So if you can teach and communicate – um, you know, it's going to make you better as a coach. And it's just invaluable opportunities to get better. Um, you know, if, if your first time at leading a film session or addressing a group of kids is when you're getting a coordinator job or a head coach job, um, you're going to be severely behind the eight ball. And, you know, there's different ways to do it. You know, you, you know when I – Coach Fitz does it as well, um, do, doing film session, you know, I, I, Wednesday night, um, I, I have all our offensive guys over uh, and we make dinner and when we have a good time and we hang out. Um, but it's just an opportunity for me to get experience, you know, leading a film session, getting confident, making sure they understand, you know, I don't know if they're going home and watching their huddle highlights for two hours or if they're watching the opponent. Um, so it's just, you know, a quick way that it's initiative on your part that can get you opportunities. Like, listen, nobody's just going to hit you guys up and ask you one day, do you want to be a coordinator? Like, you're going to have to knock down the doors and prove to people that you're ready. Um, and, and there's little things that you can do that show initiative because why, at the end of the day, when the head coach sees you doing all this that's on this list right here, what, what, what are you building? You're building trust. That, that's why trust was the big word on how, how do I get to a coordinator? You have to build trust and, um, you know, in all facets. Um, and then, again, getting multiple coaches on the same page. Um, and, and I talked about earlier, you know, the makeup of each staff is different, meaning roles, various strengths and weaknesses change. As a coordinator, it's important that you understand that. Um, the more that you do, um, the more valuable you are. To the program, also learning these invaluable skills will put you one step closer to becoming a head coach. So, um, millennial coaches, all right? So, th this is not a knock on millennial coaches. I think I, I fall in the age range of millennial coaches. But what it is is it, it, it's giving them an unrealistic depiction of what the industry is. You know, there's so many ways. You know, you call plays on Madden. You know, there's these hot, trendy coordinators slash coaches that are having success, whether they're making it to the Super Bowl or putting up all, the, all these stylish points. And, you know, it's creating this facade that, you know, it's just easy, which, you know, it's just easy to get to a coordinator position or it's just easy to ascend to the top. Um, you know, it's trendy, get rich, quick schemes, you know, um, and, and, you know, there's no, there's no shortcut. Put in the time. 
Nothing worthwhile was ever given away. You know, being a defensive coordinator under an offensive head coach is a lot different than being an offensive coordinator under an offensive head coach. What I mean by that is if, you, if your head coach is primarily offensive, you're definitely going to be micromanaged as the OC versus the DC. Um, and that's just the nature of the beast. I mean, it's not good, bad, or indifferent. And I think if, you, if you're an offensive play caller, I think, you know, if, if your head coach hadn't stepped in to tell you to call a certain play in this situation, I need to meet them because, um, you know, I, I feel like that's a, a conversation that every head coach in OC has, you know, fourth and one, run it here. You know, you better not throw that slant. Um, but the, the big thing with millennial coaches, you know, just do the work. Like, and, and it's not a knock, you know, it, it's just um, – you know, if you think you're going to come in and put in one or two years, um, now now you can, you can, you can accelerate your growth. And how can you do that through networking? Right? We talked about the clinics. I mean, just like life, it's all about who you know. So if you have somebody that, that knows you in an exalted position, then yes, it, there is an opportunity that you could bypass this process that we talked about. But again, you better be able to earn trust, um, because if, if that person's name's on the line. Um, you know, and they're getting ready to get fired with, with your decisions, your decision making, you know, can you live with that? Can they live with that? Um, you know, and, and again, I think it's just, are you the hardest worker in the room? Are you setting the tempo? Are you encouraging your other coaches to work harder? Are you trying to beat them? I um, just creating that ultimate competitor type mentality um, and culture within your coaching staff. All right. Coordinator skills and responsibilities. Um, you know, ha you have to have mastery. You know, if you look at the bottom, you have to master something before you can improve it. So before, you know, especially if you're going into a situation where you've just been named coordinator and, and the system already exists, or, you know, you're not really familiar with your toys or pieces or players or coaching surrounding staff, um, the first thing you do have to do is you have to master um, the, the X's and O's of it, but also master the personnel, the relationships. You, you, you're behind the eight ball. And, and not that that's good, bad, or indifferent, and it'll take time and you can definitely get there but you have to be able to master something before you can improve it. You have to master what's already there before you can improve it. Um, I think it's really easy, you know, when they always say when coaches come in and you just replace one coach, it's really easy for that one coach to learn the terminology of the team than it is to reteach 120 teenagers new terminology to match up with that one coach. So, you know, what's necessary for the team to be successful? Second thing is you need to have an understanding of how defenses and offenses work and vice versa. I'm not saying you have to be prolific in every defense or prolific in every offense or know, you know, this, that, or the other, but understand the, the, the basic fundamentals. All right, there has to be a force player. All right, there's two high, there's one high. You know, just basic construct rules that every defense has that, that groups it into, you know, one of five categories. I think um, I was listening to Quincy Avery the other night, and he, and he was basically like, I, I loved it. Like, he basically put every defense in five categories, all right? So so there's five categories of defense. You got cover zero, which is its own category. You got two high zone, two high man, one high zone, one high man. Every defense of all time falls into those one of those five categories. Um, now, you might have some combo stuff going down, um, but, you know, being able to understand that, and then, you know, we'll get to being able to communicate that later. But um, – having the ability to see how all 22 pieces fit together. That was my biggest struggle. You know, how, how, how do I see 22 people at one time? I mean, it's, it's a lot, um, you know, line coaches, I don't know how you guys do it. Seeing five guys in one play. Um, so, you know, seeing 22 pieces and how they fit together um, is big and, and processing speed is another thing that people don't talk about. You know, one, all right, the defense has given us the puzzle piece or the offense has given us the puzzle piece. We lined up or sound, we're good to go. Or, we like what we, we – we think we know what we like versus this. Um, and, and then how, how do we get to the answer is another thing. Because if you're coaching fast, if you're coaching in a tempo offense, if you're coaching things like that, your brain has to be able to process things. All right, that corner's up, that corner's back. You know, they're rolling or what they do last play. Um, so you have to be able to process quick. The one thing I will say about tempo is it forces the defense. Unless they got a check-in, um, you're probably going to get base because for them to be able to signal in some crazy elaborate blitz stunt front, um, you know, in the amount of time that I can line up, give a formation, give a play, um, that's pretty impressive. So, um, but j just seeing how they all fit together and, and, you know, I just talked about the ability to make decisions in high pressure situations, um, not only quickly, but be accountable for them. You know, anybody can Monday morning quarterback, you know, it's, it's real easy five minutes after the fact, oh, coach, we should have done this. Well, yeah, you're right. If I had five minutes to analyze the situation, we probably would have done that. Um, but, 
I mean, just being able to live and die with those decisions. So it's just so important that you put yourself in the best position to have success through mastery, through understanding how offenses and defenses work, understand what we're trying to do versus scheme, um, and then, you know, how all 22 pieces to fit. Um, <clears throat> the easy coach, stuff, a, you know, is – a couple questions here for you. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Coach. Uh, when do you know if it's the right time to leave your job uh, to become a, a coordinator? Um, that's tricky. That, that, that's tricky because it's all about fit. And so what I'll say to that is, you know, sometimes you do have to bet on yourself and go out and put yourself on a limit if, if you, you know, we're ultimate competitors, right? So, you know, having that athletic streak in us, we're always going to bet on ourselves. But the grass isn't always greener on the other side. And it's kind of, you know, they talk about, you know, put, put that same formula with head coaches, um, getting a head coaching job. You know, is it worth it to go to a program that, that's two and nine if you don't have faith in the administration, if you don't have faith in the things that you're going to get to succeed, to be able to go two and nine three years in a row and then not be able to get another head coaching job? It's kind of the, the same thing falls with coordinating, you know. Um, you you can go if, if you're if you're gung ho about the title and you're gung ho about being a coordinator, um, you know you could probably get a coordinator job. It just might not be where you want it to be. Um, and, and just doing the mathematics, you know, usually there's two to three coordinators on every staff if you're not counting co coordinators. Um, and obviously you have way more coaches than that. So the, the rule of thumb is you know there's always going to be less coordinators than position coaches. But um, I, I think it's all about fit, man. I think you also have to look at leadership. You know, if your coach. You know, one of the biggest things, is there people on staff that have been where you're trying to go? Are there coordinators on staff that you can learn from, that you can develop from? Can, can you develop from your head coach? You know, when we talk about it all the time. Kids sit there, every, every high school kid in North Carolina, Texas, wherever, everybody's lifting three hours, everybody's practicing. All right, Texas, you guys might be lifting five hours, but, you know, everybody's lifting and practicing. So what are you doing in that off time to separate yourself? Well, the same thing's true as coaches. You know, everybody's coaching practice for three hours when you're coaching, all you're doing is you're reciting something. You're not learning anything new. There's no dialogue. There's no expansion in conversation. So when you come back to the office, you know, are, are, are you, you reflecting on practice? Are you getting up with your coordinators? Are you like, hey, coach, what do you think about this? Or how would you stop this? Or, you know, relying on the resources around you, especially, you know, if you've got older coaches on staff. That, I mean, you know, some good staffs have multiple guys that have been coordinators before. And just being able to lean on those resources, um, you know, the, the, how bad do you want it? I mean, I guess that's the only the only the only way to to synopsis it. And um, you know, I, I don't know if there's ever a right time. I, I think I think that's kind of on you to to decipher and you know, kind of read the writing on the wall. And if you feel it's right for you, jump. But I know that nothing great ever happened if you didn't get nervous first. So if you're nervous about it, go ahead and do it. And uh, here's one more, coach. Do you uh, do you ultimately? Do you feel ultimately the best coordinators have good position coaches or should a coordinator know every position group on his side of the ball? Okay. Well, if you look to my second last bullet point on this, um, you know, I would rather have great position coaches on, on I mean, I, I would just rather have great position coaches because it would make my life a lot easier. Um, you know, empowering your position coaches. Um, I always joke with our coaches all the time. Somebody once told me, like, you can tell how good a coach is by how good their individual time is. You know, if, if they're sitting there and they can coach two and a half hours of Indy, um, you know, they got drills on drills, um, which shows prolific mastery and knowledge of the position. Um, but you have to ask yourself, you know, if one of your coaches quit, could you coach their position? You know, you're rolling in day one uh, of summer and your offensive line coach quits. You know, are, are you going to be able to take over that position and coach it as good as it needs to be done with your name attached to it, um, you know, and, and that's, you know, everybody wants to call plays, everybody wants to do this, but dang, do, do, do you know how to gap down? Do you know how to pass pro? Do, do you know, um, you know, and I mean, do you know coaching techniques? I mean, uh, there, there's various things, um, you know, and, and then as you progress to be a head coach, you know, it, you got to know both sides of the ball because if somebody quits, you got to step in. Um, you can't just give that position group a time off. So, you know, I would rather have competent assistant coaches that can sit there and get the job done and empower them and, um, you know, let them coach to the best of their ability. One more for you, Coach. Uh, in what order do you value a job when it comes to, when it comes to taking it? Uh, what's the most and least important? So, like, administration, leadership, pay, the community, school, culture, resources, et cetera? Gotcha. Um, well, first off, I, I think, you know, I think, the amount of growth that, that is possible with, with the job. I think that that is one of the, 
um, you know, I, I think that's huge because at, at the, you know, what are you going to get out of it? Um, but the second thing is I think administration, um, huge. And, and that all goes back to fit because, you know, I, I've been in some great places where there wasn't vertical alignment between the coaches and the, and the leadership or the administration. Um, and it wasn't a good fit. You know, how many times in this profession do we see um, a principal hire a coach and then that principal leave or take another job or what out. And then now this lamed up coach is stuck with a new principal that they didn't get to hire. And now you're just in a no-win situation. So I think administrative support is always the most key factor because despite anything else going on, um, as long as you have administrative support, I feel like you can navigate any water. Um, and, you know, we, we've been really lucky. I mean, I think we've got one of the best principals there is. Um, and, you know, he, he's a Richmond County guy, so he, he understands how important football is. So, so th th that's really good. Um, but, you know, also, um, so, so I interviewed for a college job one time. And, and when I sat down, you know, I came in, I came gung-ho. I had, you know, all my papers in order. I, I had my resume and, and things to go. I was ready to rock. And um, I was like, yeah, man, like, think about it. You, you're going to have the opportunity to coach college. Like, th th this is what you dream of. This is a way for you to bridge the gap. You know, you didn't play college ball. You weren't a GA, but this is a way for you to get your foot in the door. Um, and then, you know, after having conversation and going back to leadership, you know, with the head coach that they didn't have a plan, I was like, you know, well, how are we going to recruit these kids? And it was a lower tier school. And I was like, well, you know, we need to do something about signing day, this, that, and the other. And they were like, well, nobody's going to sign here. And I was like, well, uh, like basically for a signing day, nobody's going to put the hat on and declare to this college. And I was like, well, really? Because every school in your conference is doing this and they are killing the crap out of kids in Charlotte. Um, and all our kids are going to those schools and not you. So, um, you know, it, it, there wasn't an alignment fit. And, and you know, I, I need to see detailed plan before I just sit there and put my name or my life or my future in jeopardy. You know, if you have a family, kids, like I need to see a plan, a plan, a well thought out plan of how we're going to attack this, how we're going to grow. Um, and, you know, some situations are a little more volatile than others. If you're going into a stable program, obviously it's a little bit more conservative of a move, but you know, if you're going into a volatile program or, or things like that, you know, you need to have some reassurance and um, it, it starts in the leader and the vision. And, and, you know, if you believe in the coach and you think that you can grow from the coach and um, get better, I, I think, you know, that's everything. Uh, do you prefer coaching from the field or in the box and why? Dang. Um, so early in my career, I was confined to the box. Um, I hated it. Hated it. Had so much energy, raw energy, ready to go. You know, wanted to be able to impact the team, um, ready to get after it. Um, and then two years ago, I tran transitioned to the field. Um, the thing, I, I think I'm, well, I'm not going to say that about play calling, but um, I think my play calling is better from the box just because I can see the whole field. I don't think I have tendencies as much to the boundary or to the sideline or to the field. Um, but I, I do think, you know, being calm, cool, and collected is very important when Colin plays. You know, we talk about quarterbacks all the time. You know, your quarterback can't be a rah-rah guy. You know, your linebackers, your receivers, all the running backs, all those guys can be rah-rah guys. Quarterback cannot be a rah-rah guy. He has to sit there and um, live in that even kill, um, not too high, not too low realm. And I think the same is true of a, as a play caller. You know, if you get too excited or you let your emotions get the best of you and you don't start thinking clearly um, – you know, you need to be cool, calm, calculated in your decisions and, and two steps ahead, you know, when you're calling setup plays and plays to set up plays and just kind of constantly be thinking and, and processing, um, you know, quickly. But, um, you know, as you can see, all, all this stuff is pretty relative. I mean, call sheets, great sheets, all that stuff it, it just goes with the territory. But I think what a lot of people miss is, you know, you don't understand how much that you have to put in as far as stats, huddle input, being able to self-scout. Um, and then also being able to teach the game. I think being able to teach the game is huge. But, again, if you have assistants, um, you know, our, our assistants are wonderful. My O-line coach is, is two doors down from me. I, I tell them what we want for practice, and, you know, we have a little feedback. Um, our receivers coach is a volunteer coach off campus. I send them a text. Um, and that's the biggest thing is to make sure that what we're installing, especially installing packages, that we're all on the same page. You know, I don't want my O-line coach installing sprint outs if, you know, we're, we're, we're doing run game over here in the backfield. Like, it, it's just making sure everybody's on the same page of what the expectations are um, and, and just communicating. I think as a leader, you, you have to over-communicate because when you don't communicate enough or, or even if you just leave silence, people kind of fill in the gaps with information of what they think or what they um, 
suppose is going to happen. And that's where, you know, things get lost and um, the miscommunication happens. So going back to my all 22, all right. So ha having the ability, to how all 22 pieces fit together. All right. So I struggle with this. I, you, somebody asked me, you know, what was my, one of my biggest weaknesses was learning how all 22 pieces fit together. All right. So this is one of our playbooks. If you, if you notice all, all these plays are drawn with pencil, um, you know, it, it's old school, but you got every defense up there. You know, you got your five, two, which is essentially your three, four. You got your five, two with your bear, which is your zero and two threes. Um, you got your five, three, which is essentially, um, you know, your three, three stack, or I'm sorry, your three, five, which is your three, three stack. Nobody's running five, three anymore. And you got your four, three, your two even fronts and um, four, uh, four. What's up, coach? Uh, two, uh, a couple questions here. Okay. Uh, do you guys have a passing game, uh, passing game or run game coordinator? How do you operate together? We do not have a passing game and run game coordinator. Um, just because, so our, our scenario is a little different. Um, so what's, what's happened in the past is, you know, our, 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 I, me being the coordinator, we, we found ways to split practice. So when we throw on air, I go with the quarterbacks and the receivers, um, and, and we're just working on completion percentage, running our route trees, all that stuff. When I go with the line, we're walk, working pass pro, inside run. Um, that way I, I'm kind of being able to manage both. But our head coach, um, who doesn't coach a position, he just kind of freelances. Um, you know, if I need him for a certain day to help a board option or things like that, he will help me on that as long as I communicate that to him ahead of practice. But going back to trust, um, this last year was actually our first year that our head coach switched over to defense. So, again, the past couple uh, – my whole career being an offensive coordinator, I've worked under an offensive head coach, which is a lot different than, you know, working with a head coach who, who, who's running your defense. But I think that just speaks – it goes back to trust, man. If you can involve that trust and they trust you to, to run – I mean – He's won two state championships as an OC, so for him to turn that over, um, I know that's his baby. Um, so um, th that's just kind of where we are. But do you have another question, Coach? Yes, sir. Uh, what was your first big conflict as a new offensive coordinator, and how did you handle it? Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I just think there's certain rules within um, – you know, the coaching profession, kind of like, you know, if, if you're a position coach, don't coach other people's positions. You know, if, if you're a coordinator, you know, one, you're not the head coach, so you, you can't just bark something into existence. Um, but two, you know, just having a disagreement. Um, I think, you know, one, one, of, one of the biggest things, and it was kind of in that co-coordinator scenario where we actually um, won a JV conference championship, um, my head coach – did not come to any JV games that year. Um, and so what, what that did, you know, it, it left a lot of wee, leeway and open interpretation between the assistants. Um, and I knew that we, we had some people coming to watch the game, um, some future players. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that I, I displayed in our offense, you know, the ability to, to go five wide and do some certain things. And, you know, one of our coaches basically just came up to me and he was the head JV coach. I'm calling the plays, but he's the head JV coach and our O-line coach. And basically um, tells me that, you know, let's not lose a game trying to impress a kid. And and he was right. He was every bit right, keeping me level-headed. Um, but I think, you know, one of the big things is it's just all about respect, you know, and, you know, if you can get in the back room and you can drink some beers and hang out, um, you know, and you just have genuine respect and appreciation for um, the, the guy that you're working with. Um, you know, I, I think that's huge. Now, I will say one thing, though. If you're co-coordinating or, or whatnot, you know, it, it's so imperative, just, just like parenting kids, that, you know, if we're out there and, you know, I say something in drill and, and we're co-coaching this position, you know, if I say the sky's purple, you got to say the sky's purple. Now, we can go back in the coach's office after practice and you, we, we can talk about how the sky's red or blue or anything else, but in front of the kids providing that united front, you know, that, that, that's huge. Now, at the same time, you know, don't be the coach that doesn't put in any time and shows up like the kid without his freaking homework and then just starts blurting out answers in class. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not going to slow down what we do to, to, to accommodate somebody that's not doing their part. Um, so um, kind of going back. So, so th this is what I had. And so that's what I did every day, man. I just went through our playbook. This is the blank template. Um, I just sit there and I draw it up to the right. I draw it up to the left. I pull key, pitch key. Um, you know, just doing this kind of and, – and the more that you draw it, you'll see how the patterns within um, the, the schemes take place. And, and, and it's really basic because it's just the same repetitive motions happening over and over and over again. 
Um, and so, you know, being able to communicate that, being able to put tangible evidence in kids' hands, um, you know, and also helping your assistant coaches grow as well. Um, so I think that's one way to be able to solve the all 22 puzzle. I think another way is just watching film, um, you know, and it's just, it's, you're going to constantly get better at it. The thing is there, there, there's so much growth between your first year and second year coaching. Um, and the same is true as coordinating. Like there's so much growth between year one and year two, and there's even more growth between year two and year three. Um, and, and it's just exponential. So, um, you know, that that's the biggest thing. Yes, sir. Uh, can, coach. You go, can you go back uh, one slide really quick? Yes, sir. So, and if, if you guys want to hit me up after this, you know, I, I can get you um, the, the blank ones. The only issue is you might have to find a way to give it a vector file just because I, I mean, it's going to come in like a, a, a screen printed copy. Um, but, you know, being able to draw every formation, I mean, you look on our even fronts over here. Um, we got our threes to the right and our two eyes to the left, our shades to the left. So, um, you know, you can kind of get whatever you want, being able to pull pitch and just understanding schemes and um, how to account for fronts. All right, and then this was our, our past play one. Obviously, you know, you, you go to clinics, things like that. We just sit there and, and you know, be able to drop our pass plays and sprint outs and, um, you know, just being able to draw over and over and over again in details. And, um, you know, Bill Belichick, Bill Belichick has his whole blotting plays and, um, you know, doing the work and blotting, 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 um, and all that tedious work. Well, you know, this was kind of my version of that, um, just drawing and drawing and wanting to learn and wanting to get better and, you know, sitting down with people. I, I knew I didn't want to run the triple option forever. Um, finding people that, that were proficient and not run the triple option. You know, my time spent in the wing tee was amazing. Um, we, we still carry a lot of, you know, remnants of the wing tee and what we do today. Um, and I kind of hit this earlier. Your peers are going to be the ones that get you hired. Um, you know, you're thinking now, how do I impress this coach? How do I impress this principal, this superintendent? But in reality, it's the coworker next to you it is the person that's going to get their principalship. It is the next coach up in your building. It is the next guy on your staff. And trust me, you know what these guys look like. Who are the coaches that have it all together? Who are the coaches that are organized, that are on time? Who are the coaches that have their drills together? Who are the coaches, you know, it's not just a Friday night, show up, flex, stick the chest out. You know, who, who are the coaches that, that are living, breathing, talking? Like you can tell by looking at somebody whether they got it going on or not. Um, and, and those are the people that you need to connect to and, and network with. Um, and it doesn't matter how much you know that, that that's why the clinic season is so important is, you know, I, I used to have this whole mantra when I was young, dumb and stupid in this profession that, you know, I didn't need no friends. I, I, I didn't get into coaching football to make friends. I don't need friends. But and the reality was I might need that person on the sideline across from me to hire me in two years when I get fired. So j just walking around like I'm better than you or I'm just ready to start a not fight, but, you know, just have a rivalry with, with anybody and everybody. Um, you know, that, that, that was not conducive to where I wanted to go and, and the goals that I had for myself. So um, I think it's really important to, to look at the big picture and look at, you know, who is going to be able to impact me on my journey and where I want to go. Um, and one of the last things, you know, before we get to our supplements is just um, the ego. I, I think ego's hindered a lot more coaches um, than it's helped. And the thing about ego is it, it can come at any point in time. Um, you know, you can have success for a few years and then you get big headed. Again, we talked about the game being fluid and ever evolving. Um, and I think that's why it's just important to surround yourself with um, good people that will give it to you straight. You know, you don't want a bunch of yes men around you telling you that you're great and things like that. You want people that are going to challenge you, um, you know, and, and push you to get better. Um, you know, I, I know there's some things that I've done as a young coach that I, that I wish I would I wish I could have done again. And it was just simply because of the ego. You know, you, you think you know everything and you think you're better than you are and you, and you really haven't put in any time. And, um, you know, I, I think it's very – I think self-awareness is, is huge in this profession and, and knowing where you're at and your growth and your journey. All right, so this is what a practice schedule looks like for us. Um, you know, not that, you know, I'm trying to give details of how we practice schedule or anything like that, but, you know, just being able to go through it and schedule out different periods between Indy and – um, you know, scripts and, and what we're going to do Monday versus Tuesday versus three day or Wednesday, well, three days, sorry. Um, you know, on, on our tackle heavy day, on a run heavy day, um, you know, how are those coinciding? Uh, if we got extended um, 
pass on air or seven on seven or team screen or pass pro or however we want to do it, um, you know, do, do we fill the time slots? And, and not only do we fill the time slots, but are we, are we getting better? Like, is, is the game film translating to what we do in practice? You know, being able to, to re- switch these drills out to, to what our team needs is imperative. Um, and, again, if, if any of you guys need anything as far as that goes, um, just feel free to reach out. Um, I can clean some of this up for you. Um, call sheets, you know, these are example call sheets. It's changed a little bit everywhere I've went. Um, you know, some of these are back from 2017, 2016. So, um, but, you know, j- just being prepared and being able to communicate and, um, you know, just doing confidence. You know, I- I've done everything from wristbands to, um, you know, being able to play with tempo to, you know, uh, charting our first 10 plays. Um, so, you know, there's not a right or wrong way, but you better be prepared and you better be able to communicate that to your head coach. And um, when things don't work, you better have a, a, a solid answer on why they're not working or what we can do to improve it. Um, because there's a lot riding on it. Um, this is what our game, this is what our game grade looks like, our grade sheet. Um, this is what a blank one looks like. Not that it's anything groundbreaking again, but you know, when, when you're giving game grades for multiple people, you know, dang, I, I don't envy those O-line coaches because I know giving game grades for like 60 cats has got to be brutal. Um, maybe not 60, but uh, it's a lot. Um, so, you know, being able to do that, give comments, give feedback, that, that's what a filled out one looks like. Um, you know, just being able to put this stuff together and give your kids feedback, it's all a part of the teaching process. Um, again, notice nothing I've said today has talked about column plays or anything like that. It's, it's all about – how can we get better? How can we teach to our kids? How can we, um, you know, push the envelope and, and manipulate the curve and, and, and kind of get better? This is a um, script, believe it or not, from our first week in the summer this past year, actually. Yeah, because you, as you can see, we were trying to do way too much. Um, my head coach told me to gear it back, um, which he was right. We just weren't ready for it. You know, we had a new quarterback, things like that. But, you know, we got all our board plays over here. I'm ready to rock. Um, inside run on the sled, which if you guys don't do that, I think that's one of the greatest things that you can do. It's one of the best things I've got from the wing tee. Um, it keeps you running back from bouncing it, and you can't brother-in-law that defensive end because we are pulling and trapping straight into a sled that's bringing the funk. All right? Ten, uh, perfect plays, you know, 10 plays on air at the end of practice, just execution. Um, RPO team tempo was something that we did, kind of almost like what Coach Bailey did yesterday. The only difference was we did it as a team, and we spotted it and went through our different tempos. Um, and then obviously team, um, just regular team. And then we got our screens down there for our screen period. So, you know, obviously we didn't do every single one of these every day. Um, there's no way to show mastery. Um, and the funny thing is we did it for like two weeks and I, I think we, we didn't get as good as enough as we needed to. We, we tried to rush for the basics. So um, I, I think that's very important, especially to all, you know, new coordinators, coaches, you have to master the basics first. You know, mastery is the most important thing. Um, this is a half field uh, sheet, for example. Um, you know, it, you know, our, our head coach did our special teams this year, um, but just being able to chart kicks and put marks and you know add up averages and where they like to kick from. Do they kick from the hash? Do they switch back and forth? You can f- find out some great tendencies on that. Um, and then also, you know, you got your quarter field sheet, the exact same thing. Um, you know, j- just having resources and, and things that, to to be able to uh, adjust and stay organized and find tendencies and resources, um, I, th- I think that's huge. And again, 2020, you know, what are you doing? There's tons of these things out there. I mean, you know, you can get the air raid ones that's got um, the shelf and, and all that stuff on it. Or, um, or, or, you know, I mean, you can get the wing too. I mean, like whatever you want, you can have. So, so there, there's no, um, you know, you, you guys, it's just how bad do you want it? Um, putting in offensive stats, man, that's another thing, you know, that, that kind of falls under the coordinator territory. You know, do you want to call plays, but do you want to spend two hours putting in stats? Um, you know, and, and I've been lucky enough, you know, I've had, you know, our head coach has helped me do it several times. Um, several times, you know, I've been on my own. Um, but, you know, how much do you love it? You know, are, are you willing to give up time watching, you know, Sunday football or, or Saturday football? Um, you know, so uh, – that that's one of the things that you, along with you know doing uh doing film and uh laundry and all those unforgotten things that go with the coordinator title that is imperative for your program to have success being able to self scout this is why the huddle thing is so important you know um you know you, you have to find out where you're weak and i saw somebody say yesterday you know you create tendencies to break them so you know you have your formations that you like to throw out of and you have your formations that you like to run out of 
And, um, you know, I mean, but being able to get feedback and, and seeing what your opponents are seeing, I think is important because, you know, you want to be able to break your tendencies um, from time to time. Um, and so that, that's really all I got. Um, you know, you, you can see my contact right there. If you have any questions, if you want to get um, any of those um, resources, um, but is there any questions or anything you got coach? Uh, yeah. If anybody has any uh, last minute questions for coach, coach, if you want to just uh, stop sharing the screen at the top, you'll be mm -hmm. able to see the chat if anybody uh, writes in. You. But while we're waiting, if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop your Twitter handle uh, on the bottom just so we can all continue to stay connected. Um, this is obviously, this has been one of the benefits of, uh, you know, when we started this thing back last week is so many different coaches that, uh, you know, hadn't didn't know each other are now you know talking more frequently and connecting and that's that's been the blessing of this whole thing so uh you know once again like coach touched on it earlier man we you know we're taking a situation we're just making the most out of it so I appreciate everybody not only you know and, and don't get me wrong the speakers have been tremendous um you know coaches is, is, is no different so we appreciate coach van horn for jumping on here but um you know we appreciate all the coaches for for jumping in as well you know this thing is nothing without the presenters and, and, and all you coaches looking to learn. So that's the, that's the main thing about this stuff. So it was a great job. And, um, you know, it's funny, right? Because we weren't really totally sure what you wanted to speak about, but I think this was a tremendous topic. I believe I'm mean, added value to a lot of people in here. Absolutely, Coach. Oh, you got a question there, Coach, from uh, Coach Moreland. <clears throat> have you ever been disrespected as a young coach from an older coach, and how have you dealt with it? Um, I have, but it's not anything that I didn't bring on myself. Um, so, you know, talked earlier about, you know, the ability to work with some great DC, some hard-nosed guys that, you know, try to put a young guy in their place. Um, there was one time that I, I caught our defense without, with, with 10 guys on the field. And this is a long time ago. You know, we were small school. Only the head coach and the, the um, spotter up top had a head, headset on. And so, you know, I was like, I told our DC, I was like, Coach, we only got 10. We only got 10. We only got 10. He's looking around. He's counting. You know, he calls timeout. So, you know, me just frustrated with the situation. I'm like, man, how does that even happen? Um, of course, I wasn't talking about our DC. I was talking about how does the spotter miss that we don't have 11 guys on the field. Um, but my man proceeded to step out during the entire timeout at Pamlico County and just stare at me the whole time in front of the stands. Didn't address the players, didn't address the kids, didn't fix anything. Um, it just basically bullied me down. Um, and so, you know, that kind of let me know, you know, think twice before you open your mouth and, and inter interject. Um, but you know, I think I think when you come from a place of respect, um, you know, you got to be able to coach in that environment. And, and you know, I would coach for a guy, you know, that that would cuss you up one side and down the other. But you know, after that, it was all love. And it's not personal. We're all here to get better, right? So if you can function in that environment, um, I, I think you're going to be okay. I mean, how how can we as coaches tell our players, you know, to be have thick skin and take, you know, grow and let let us chew them out and make them better? But we can't do the same things as coaches. Mm -hmm. How how are we? above reproach so um i think you know being able to humble yourself is big and um you know just lean on the great people around you i mean if you're fortunate enough to be in a situation where you've got great coaches around you um i think that's a you know, tremendous in growth oh great do you call plays based on your personnel does your system say the same and the kids have to learn it um so funny you ask this question so I've always been a guy that loves to throw, loves to throw. You know, when we first came in, you know, we were RPO, whatever. Um, but, you know, one high man's the, the answer to all the RPOs. Safety start robbing. Um, they start rocking down. They'll fill that backer, and the safety will try to jump it. Um, and if you don't got outside guys, um, you got no shot. And so that, that's kind of what we've always tried to be. Well, up until this year, I've had 6'5 and 6'4 quarterbacks, which is crazy ever since I've been in Charlotte. Like, I've never had quarterbacks this tall. And so being able to throw over the middle was a little bit easier for us. Well, this year, you know, we had a quarterback that tore his ACL on the third play of the game, third offensive play of the game against Butler. And, um, you know, we, we winged it for that. But we basically went to the single wing. I mean, I, we've got one of the best running backs in, in, in the city, I feel like. And, um, you know, we went foot to foot. And, you know, we were one of the only two teams that was leading Myers Park at the end of the first half. Um, I think Richmond was the other. So, um, you know, Yes, we, we will change. Our, our job is to put our kids in the best situation to succeed, right? We're, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and try to put a square peg into a round hole and it's got to be this way. I mean, I, we, we've got to fit our kids. Now, the only thing that when we went single wing, we huddled, you know, and, and we flopped our strength and we were going, you know, tackle, tight end, guard. We were taking everybody over. And the H's, I mean, it was some wild shifts. 
But what I didn't take into account was my defensive players playing both ways. So both my tight ends were defensive players. All my H-backs were linebackers. So after the first quarter and whatnot, um, that great game plan just got gassed as soon as, you know, they were able to tempo us and we couldn't play keep away. But le legitimately, the last three games, we went straight single wing, Notre Dame box, snapped it to our running back and, and just got downhill. And one of the best things that that's ever done for us is it got us physical in our run game. You know, spread, you know, pass set and all that good stuff. Spread soft, you know, you, you can make all your assumptions that you want. But um, getting downhill and, and just, you know, giving your players the best chance to succeed. Because as coaches, you know, we've always got next year. You know, that we, we, I mean, I might not be here, I might not be there, but I'm going to be coaching somewhere. Um, but as the players, they don't have that luxury. So I think it's very important for us to give them everything that we've got and put them in the best chance to succeed. And, um, you know, whatever we can do to ensure their success is, is kind of what's paramount. So. A solid point. Solid point. Anybody else have any questions? <clears throat> Give it a couple, few minutes. Leave, I'll leave this up anyway for a few minutes in case anybody wants to jump on and grab some.